Round block number 12. Hey everyone, it's Adam and Jay from the AeroWorks Workshop and today we're going to be talking about a real important topic and that's ATC communications, uh, UAS communications. I think that's been a real popular topic lately on the forums. Uh, whether you're operating as a 333 operator or a newly certificated 107 operator, at some point you're probably going to be talking to ATC via radio and uh, we want to talk a little bit about that today. Right, and right here we have a handheld radio that you would typically use in order to talk to the air traffic control tower. Right, and these are actually different than like a scanner. These are actually a two-way uh, VHF radio and we'll put some links down to some various models. They're, they're all different price ranges. But there's some important things about talking on the radio. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But one thing um, that has also come up a little bit is the airspace, airspace authorizations and waivers. Um, and there's some confusion over when do I need one over the other. Right. Um, and we're not going to get into how you apply for those and all that because that could be a whole other vlog. But just real quick, um, an airspace waiver is something on a more permanent basis. So similar to like a COA where let's say I live in a town where I'm always doing work around an airport that's you know right in my town that I'm in their airspace. That would be something that I would want to apply for a waiver from to allow me to always operate and I can actually request that waiver for up to four years. An airspace authorization is something that is like, you know, I'm gonna be in this airport's airspace like one time or maybe I'm traveling across country and I need I have a shoot to do and I'm gonna be there, you know, for a very short amount of time. I'm requesting an airspace authorization just to operate there for a day or so. So there's a big difference between the two. Um, the authorization, when it's in full swing, is supposed to take anywhere from pretty much an instant to, you know, maybe a day or so to be authorized, whereas the waiver now, you know, they're taking 10, 20, 30, they say up to 90 days to approve it. Which it seems to be the case with everybody always complaining right. that they're not getting them on time. Now, who would you contact for the authorization? Well, both of those are actually done online. There is, and we'll put a link down below, but there's a uh, an airspace authorization and waiver request form online. There is a paper version. I don't think anybody's doing that. But basically, you fill out your, your personal information, your company information. Uh, you can put your UAS information in there, and then you have to check one of the boxes. Now, it's kind of hidden in there. The very first one is the airspace authorization. Again, that's different than a waiver. And then all the waivers are below there. So your waivers are like waivers for night, waivers for over people, waivers for airspace. So again, know the difference between those two. And again, we won't get into how you apply for that. We'll put a link down there so you can find them. But uh, it's important to know that there is a big difference between a waiver and an authorization. Because that would be a whole 50 minute blog trying to oh, do that. <laughs> yeah, and especially now because it's so new, it, it, it essentially just became active, what, the 29th of August, right. or 1st of September, whatever. So they're trying to still figure that out. People are bombarding them with requests. It's probably going to take six months before that process gets going uh, and, and, and moving. Now. One other thing, what else do we need to talk about? Is uh, registration of your drones. What's the difference between here we have an N number and there we have a FAA number, but right. is that a hobby FAA number or is that a... Well, there's actually two. So, okay. so back in the 333 days, you pretty much had to just register your aircraft like an, a real aircraft. So you went through the paper process. It used to take about 30 days. Then it was 45, then it was pushing 90 uh, to get an actual in number registration. Well, we all know back in what uh, December last year, around Christmas, right. they said, oh, you got to go register your drones, or you're going to be put in prison. So everybody ran out and they logged in to that registermyuas.fa.gov right. and they registered their name essentially, and you were issued one number that you oh, could right. stick on all your drones as a hobbyist. Well, as a commercial operator, you can now use that same online process. In fact, we have a, a video on that, how to do that. We'll put a link down for that as well. But if you are going to take this same Phantom 4 that you were operating as a hobbyist last year, and now you're a certificated 107 pilot, and you want to operate commercially, you need to go back on that same website, and instead of the hobbyist side, you're going to click the non-hobbyist side or the commercial side. You're going to register this particular serial numbered aircraft, and you're going to get a unique number. Now the good thing is you can do that in five minutes. You're done, you're registered, you're legal. This one is still available, many people don't know that, 
but it does take a lot more paperwork, it takes a lot more time, and you're gonna have to wait 90 days probably to get an in number. So let me get this straight. Every one of my drones I would have to register then on the commercial side. Exactly, of it. and that's the big <clears throat> difference is that the original hobbyist one, you got one number to Jay, and Jay could put that one number on all of his aircraft. Which I did, I had helicopters, yep. I put them on drones, airplanes. So. Anything over that two sticks of butter, you had to register. Uh, but now Jay, uh, being a, a certificated 107 pilot as well, he now, to be legal, needs to go back on the website for that one aircraft and register, and they actually call it your inventory. So you would create a list of all your commercial aircraft, your Inspire Pro, your Phantom 4, your whatever, and each number would be unique to just this aircraft, and it's a $5 charge. So again, a little bit more money, not much, it's five bucks an aircraft, you know, it's the cost of doing business, but you would have to do that, um, commercially now. Now that's, it's important that we have our aircraft register because A, it's a requirement and two, how are we going to tell the tower who we are, right? right? And that's really the topic of today's vlog is ATC communications. So I've seen a lot of people say, well, you know, I've got this long FA3W123456 eight number versus an N number. When we're flying aircraft, we call a tower and we say, you know, Kenosha Tower, Cessna 419 Alpha Mike, you know, or whatever the aircraft number is, okay? Just like I would call with my Inspire 1, uh, we have several COAs to operate within airspace. I would call up and say, you know, Kenosha Tower, UAS 810 Alpha Kilo, and then we would go on with our requests. Now, for you guys that have these long, long numbers, that's something you may have to experiment a little bit with. But what I would recommend is the first part of all these numbers is pretty much the same. It's usually right. either FA3 or FAA, so you don't want to use that. But the last three, the last four, that's probably unique. So you could uh, call up and say, you know, Kenosha Tower, UAS, Lima Hotel Kilo, and that's all they really need to know. They just need to know a unique designator for this aircraft. Um, one thing, in, in all communications with, with towers is being very brief. They don't have time to chat, okay? They don't have time to, to hear your story and, and all that. And that's why when we, when we are learning how to fly full-size aircraft, it's, it's really three things. It's who you are, where you are, and what you wanna do. You can cut out all the middle stuff and everything in between. So an example might be, give me an example of we're out flying, let's say okay. we've got a factory uh, that's three miles from the airport. Okay, so we'd have to call the tower and I'd be like, uh, yeah, Kenosha Tower, this is Jay, and um, I'm flying, uh, let me see, oh yeah, no November uh, 819 Alpha Kilo, and um, I'm right over here by the McDonald's, and I'm going up to like 200 feet, I think, and... Um, Meanwhile, I'm in my Learjet, <laughs> I'm going, I'm coming in for landing, what is this guy gonna get off the radio, right? So let's take that same example. Jay's out flying commercially as a 107 pilot. He's two or three miles from the airport. He has authorization. Again, we're not gonna talk about how he got the authorization. We'll just say he has it already. But now he's doing a job. He's flying a real estate job or a commercial building. He's taking a few pictures at 100 feet. He's flying the Inspire here, 810 Alpha Kilo, and he wants to call up the tower. Now how I would do it, is I would call up, and again, the airport knows that we're allowed to be there because of our authorization. I would say Kenosha Tower, UAS 810 Alpha Kilo, two miles to the south, making a photo flight at 100 feet. That's it, boom, I just, I just answered, gave them all the information. Now, if they wanna tell me something after that, that's fine, they would call up and they would say, UAS Alpha, or excuse me, UAS 810 Alpha Kilo, uh, you know, permission granted or traffic is a Cessna at 500 feet in your location. The big thing is, is using known reporting points. And that's very important. If you've taken a sectional chart uh, study guide or any of the things to get your 107, you've heard of something called VFR reporting points. Now these are known points on every sectional chart that the ATC organizations in your area are very well aware of and they really need to be aware of. So they don't necessarily know where the Burger King is that Jay's talking about, right. but they do know where the, let's say the electric uh, companies uh, or the power oh, plant okay. smokestacks are because that makes those, sense. those smokestacks are on a chart and they have a little VFR reporting point. So if I say I'm two miles to the east of the power plant, they know pretty much where I am. If Jay says I'm two miles 
uh, from the airport next to a McDonald's, they don't have a clue where you are. And again, it makes us sound very unprofessional if we call in like that. So it's very important right. to know a VFR reporting point or uh, you can use a nav aid like a VOR um, and you can say I'm on, I'm you know two and a half miles south of the airport on the 180 radial. Oh, that okay. really narrows it down because it pretty much puts you a distance and an exact location from the airport and ATC understands that. They understand things that are on sectional charts. They don't understand things that you're standing next to on the sidewalk while you're doing your drone flight. So we want to keep it brief. Brief. Who we are. Who. Where. Where. And what we're doing, right? And what we're doing. Okay. And and if ATC yep. has some other requirement, they'll tell you. But it's important to cut out the ums and the ahs and I'm a certified drone pilot and I'm... Because keep in mind that you are talking on probably a radio like this and you are now tying up that channel to that tower from anybody else to talk to them. So if there's a plane coming in on final with people in it and you're umming and on on the radio, you're essentially blocking this guy who's coming in at 150 knots from talking to the tower. Plus another thing too is the tower may tell you, no, you can't take off because they don't feel comfortable that you know what you're doing or what you're exactly. talking about. Exactly. If you sound like you don't have a clue, don't plan on getting authorization. So right. think about what you're going to say. And this is, and everybody's nervous on the radio. Oh, yeah. When we're flying real airplanes, we're like, okay, I've been a pilot for 10, 20 years. And it's like, okay, what am I, I'm calling them. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do, we're going to request this, write it down, whatever, so that you're ready. Boom. When you hit that mic, and again, listening is important too. Right. Because if you're operating, you know, near an airport and there's a lot of air traffic going on, and you hear, you know, Cessna, uh, you know, uh, whatever, nine seven Victor Alpha request landing, and you go to talk, you need to wait and listen because that guy just called the tower. He's going to be waiting for a response back from the tower. So if you jump in between him, you're not only cutting off him, you're making the controller mad, nobody's getting their information done. So you need to listen first, that's the most important thing, right. is if you're on a tower's frequency that you're operating here, listen. Is there traffic? Where do I need to be looking for that traffic? Okay, now there's a break in the, tra in the, in the air communications, now I can make my call. Kenosha Tower, UAS 810 off Kilo, two miles to the south, over the power plant, Photo run at 100 feet, whatever you know, whatever your request is, and again, that's with authorization. We're not at, we're not saying that you call them for authorization right. because again, that was a kind of a misunderstanding with right. a lot of people in the 107. Because you'll get denied. <laughs> you'll, no yeah, doubt. you're and especially in, in, in when you when you're talking at a class D airport in a small town, you know, you might get some guys that are that, that like UAS, but you start talking class C, like busier airports, you know, with right. regional airlines. Forget about class B. You're not going to get authorization calling on the radio. You may be able to talk to a class D uh, airport right. and maybe you know the tower manager and you say, hey, I'm operating three miles away. Do you have any issues? No, okay, I'm good to go. But really the process is the online waiver or authorization process. So we talked about the call signs. Um, again, if you have an N number, use the N number. We don't use the N in the N number. That means North America, but in our case, on this aircraft, we're using 810 Alpha Kilo. In this aircraft, where we have this long, let's see, it's three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten numbers or letters, we don't need to tie up the radio with that. We've even had uh, times where we were operating at an airport and they said, we want you to use Aeroworks 1 right. as your call sign. Just forget the numbers. We, we know that Aeroworks 1 is the UAS. And there's probably a good chance that if you're operating near or at an airport, there's probably not 10 other UAS operators. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm gonna just gonna take a guess, there's probably not. We go out and fly every day, we don't see one drone in the air. Right. But we know there's millions of them around. So I don't know where they're all hiding, but um, you're probably going to be the only UAS guy, maybe one or two, if you're in California or somewhere. Now getting back to the registration real right. quick is, now I fly this commercially during the week. Right. Okay. And I'm doing jobs and stuff. Now on the weekends, I just want to go out and take some photos of the for foliage fun, right. and for fun. Now, is there anything different? No, that's a good question. A lot of people think, oh crap, I, I, I now made this a commercial registered aircraft. That means I can't fly for fun or for hobby. No, you can. You, you basically just want to operate the aircraft under the rules that you're operating. So if you're operating commercially, needs to be registered commercially, you need to obey by whatever the rules of your 107 or 333. If you're out on a Sunday with family, follow the hobbyist rules. Don't fly above 400 feet, don't fly out of sight, don't fly over a crowd of people, 
you're good to go. So yeah, if you've registered commercially, you're fine for both hobby and commercial. However, the other side, if you're only registered hobbyist, you're not technically legal to operate commercially because this aircraft is not registered as a commercial aircraft, it's registered okay. as a hobbyist aircraft. That so that's sense. important to know. But we'll put links to all the things we talked about. We'll right. put links to the registration site. We'll put links to some of the uh, radios, uh, communication things that we use. Another cool uh, item that we use is these uh, Senna Bluetooth headsets. Now we operate uh, as a 333 company and so we have to use a visual observer. Uh, 107 got rid of the uh, the observers, right. but it's still recommended. I mean, another eye in the sky, you got birds flying around, you got people walking up to you. Having a second person, whether Jay's flying or I'm flying, to say, hey, ma'am, uh, Jay's flying right now, we'll answer the questions in a second, or hey, there's a hawk over here, and, he, and Jay's looking at the UAS over here. It's important to communicate. One of the things that's nice about these is they are Bluetooth, and we can essentially just talk in our normal voice. So Jay could be standing 25 feet away right. and say, hey Adam, there's a hawk up here, or we've got someone pulling up that wants to talk to us, and I can simply hear it and talk back to him, and we don't have to shout back and forth. It doesn't interfere with any of the devices. It's, it's very low, minimal power Bluetooth. Yeah, it's a great tool that we have in yep. our arsenal here. And it's essentially hands-free. You don't have right. to push anything, you turn yep. them on, it's voice activated, we talk back and forth. So we'll put a link down in the description of these two if you are interested in something like that. Again, we've been enjoying using them, they work great, and you can I think you can bind like 20 or 30 of them together. So if you got three people, four, 10, it doesn't matter, you can use them. So guys, appreciate you tuning in today. Hopefully that cleared up some, a little some misconceptions. Anyway, right. uh, we'll put all the links down below. Make sure you like and subscribe. And until next time, fly safe. Fly safe and blue skies. <laughs>